Hi everyone, welcome to Chalk Talk Med, where I cover high yield medicine topics for students. In this video, we're going to be talking about fat necrosis. Here's an outline of our talk. We're going to start with an uh, overview of cell death and see where fat necrosis fits in. Then we're going to talk about the mechanism of ca and causes. There are two major types, enzymatic and non-enzymatic. We'll go through all of this. Then we're going to talk about the key findings on gross pathology and histology. And finally, at the end, we're going to wrap up with a bonus question with a clinical correlate to tie it all in. Let's get started. So let's start with an overview of cell death. So cell death can happen by different mechanisms. The main two are apoptosis and necrosis. And in uh, many ways, these two are pretty much the complete opposite of each other. And if you wanna learn a little bit more about the details as far as how these are different, then you can check out this video that I've listed here. But for our purposes now, uh, what we need to know is that we can't just stop here at the difference between them, because as it turns out, each of these cause cell death by additionally different mechanisms. So for apoptosis, you have the intrinsic pathway versus the extrinsic pathway. And for necrosis, you actually have six different subtypes of necrosis, and each of these subtypes indicate the uh, different morphology of that underlying necrotic tissue, and that's how they're different from each other. All right, so now let's talk about necrosis and its different tissue types. So here are the six that you saw on the last slide. Uh, first thing I want to mention here is the name. So these names can seem kind of random, but the names actually describe what the underlying necrotic tissue looks like. So they're kind of describing what the hallmark feature is of that necrotic tissue. For example, liquefactive means that that tissue is liquefied. Caseous refers to that tissue being cheese-like. Fat means that tissue has a lot of fat cell accumulation, etc. The second thing that's important to mention here is that um, each of these types of necrosis has its own specific underlying pathophysiology, specific diseases that cause them, and what the histopathology is going to look like. And those are the kind of things that you need to learn to be able to compare and contrast to be able to answer test questions about this topic. All right, so now let's talk about fat necrosis. So remember, each of our six types of necrosis has their own necrotic tissue hallmark. The hallmark here is necrosis of adipocytes, aka fat cells. So that's the problem here, and that's why the necrotic tissue has abundant amount of adipocytes in it. The second important necrotic uh, tissue feature of this type of necrosis is that on gross pathology, there's going to be a chalky white appearance, and that's classic for fat necrosis, and that's due to the presence of calcium deposits, and we'll talk about the cause for that in just a little bit. But now let's move on to the causes. So fat necrosis uh, is due to two different causes. One is mediated by enzymes and the other one is mediated by trauma. So let's start talking about each of them now. All right, so let's talk about mechanism one of fat necrosis, which is enzymatic, meaning that it's mediated by an enzyme. Specifically, the most common cause is the pancreatic lipase. So this occurs as a consequence of pancreatitis. So remember that pancreas is an important digestive organ because it contains a lot of very uh, potent digestive enzymes. The way that the pancreas protects itself from autodigestion is that these enzymes are not normally active while they're still in the pancreas. They're in their inactive form, aka known as zymogens, and they only become activated once they enter the lumen of the small intestines. What happens in pancreatitis, though, is you have a trigger or an um, underlying problem. In the U.S., the most common causes of pancreatitis are ethanol consumption and gallstones, and this trigger is going to lead to damage to the pancreatic cells, and this is going to lead to premature activation of trypsinogen to trypsin while still within the pancreas. Now, this trypsin is a very potent digestive enzyme itself, so it's going to start damaging the pancreatic tissue. The second problem is that trypsin can also lead to activation of the other digestive enzymes. So now you have all of these other digestive enzymes within the pancreas that are going to lead to autolysis, which is damage of the pancreatic tissue itself, and this is how you end up with pancreatitis. It's very important to know that this is a type of liquefactive necrosis. So what does this have to do with fat necrosis then? Well, as you can see, all these little yellow circles that I've drawn around the pancreas, these are representing nearby adipocytes and fat tissue. What happens is that once you have dying pancreatic cells, they're going to release the pancreatic lipase that was inside of them. And now this pancreatic lipase from the cells are going to go to these nearby adipocytes and cause damage to them and lead to their necrosis, as well as the hydrolysis of triglycerides and free fatty acid release. And so now this is going to cause fat necrosis around the pancreas. That's why this is known as peri, which means near pancreatic fat necrosis. So we have liquefactive necrosis as a consequence of pancreatitis itself. And secondary to that, you have lipase release, which is why this is enzymatic, so the enzyme being lipase, and this li lipase is going to damage the nearby fat cells and lead to peripancreatic adipose necrosis, which is caused by fat necrosis. So very important that in pancreatitis, you have two types of necrosis essentially that can happen, the liquefactive necrosis of the pancreas itself and the fat necrosis of the surrounding uh, adipose tissue. 
Okay, now let's talk about mechanism two, which is non-enzymatic. So of course, this means that the fat necrosis is not caused by enzymes. It's actually a lot more straightforward here. This is caused by trauma. Specifically, you have mechanical injury and trauma to fatty tissue. This is going to lead to mechanical injury of those fat cells, aka adipocytes, and it's going to lead to them becoming necrotic. This is also going to lead to release of uh, free fatty acids. And the main site where this occurs in the body is the breast, and that's because the breast, as you can see here, contains a lot of uh, adipose tissue, and it's also because it's vulnerable and exposed to getting mechanically injured. The two main uh, ways that breast injury can occur is number one, trauma. So for example, from the seatbelt from a motor vehicle collision. But the other very important mechanism you should know about is iatrogenic. This is due to uh, medical intervention, trying to evaluate and treat uh, most commonly for breast cancer. So things like uh, breast biopsy, surgery, and radiation of the breast can all lead to injury of the breast tissue and fat necrosis of those adipocytes. All right, so the final thing to learn about fat necrosis is what the tissue is going to look like on histopathology. So let's start with histology first. So number one, the adipocytes are not going to have any nuclei, and that's because the cells are dead, and dead cells don't have nuclei. So these are adipocytes right here, and you can tell that's what they are because their cytoplasm is filled with lipids. That's why it doesn't stain. So that's why you have these big blobs of white right here. And the difference between these adipocytes and the ones that I've drawn in cartoon form here is that the ones up here have nuclei because these are normal adipocytes and these are uh, adipocytes that have undergone necrosis. So the key here is when you see adipocytes without nuclei, you're looking at fat necrosis. Now, the other two findings are not on this image, but they're still pretty important to know. So in the tissue, there's going to be a lot of macrophages that are going to be filled with lipid debris. And because they're filled with lipids, they look foamy. So they're known as foamy macrophages. And that's because when these adipocytes die, they release their free fatty acids into that extracellular tissue. So now someone's going to come in and have to clean up that mess. And usually it's the job of the macrophages to come in there and phagocytose the debris. So you get foamy macrophages. And number three is that the tissue is going to have a basophilic or blue staining. And that's because um, these free fatty acids that we just talked about being released into the environment, they are anions. If you look down here, this process is known as saponification. So these free fatty acids are negatively charged, so they're going to have to bind something that's positive, and usually that's calcium. So this binding is going to lead to calcification, which is calcium depositing in this tissue, and that's going to cause a blue or basophilic staining of that tissue. All right, so those are the three important histo histological findings to know. Now let's talk about gross pathology, and there's just one important finding to know here, and that's again related to this saponification that we talked about. So as a consequence of all of this calcium depositing in the tissue, this is going to lead to the presence of this chalky white appearance, which is the classic finding for fat necrosis to be aware of. And so this is a very high yield association as shown here. You have a pancreas that has undergone fatty, uh, fat necrosis, and you have uh, several areas of chalky white deposits consistent with saponification due to fat necrosis. All right, so before we wrap up this video, let's go through a little bonus question with a clinical correlate that ties what we're learning here into some patient care that's practical. So we have a chief, chief concern of epigastric pain, nausea, and vomiting. So we have a 45-year-old man who's diagnosed with acute pancreatitis. So here, I'd like to ask you to think about two questions. Number one, think, what will the serum lipase be in this patient compared to normal or baseline? Will it be elevated, uh, decreased, or the same? And number two, if we assume that his pancreatitis is very severe, what do you expect the serum calcium levels to be? Will they be elevated or decreased? And if you want to think about this for a little bit, feel free to pause the video, um, think about it on your own, and try to answer it. And then you can unpause because we're going to go through the answers right here. So let's start with question one. So the serum lipase is going to be elevated right? Because the problem here is pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas. So you're going to have necrosis of that pancreatic tissue. This is going to lead to lipase that's normally intracellular being secreted outside of the cell. Some of that is going to end up in the serum. So the levels are going to be elevated. And in fact, this is exactly how we make the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis clinically. So when the patient comes in, uh, with abdominal pain and we're searching for the cause in the emergency department. This is the lab test that we check. One of the lab tests is the serum lipase and it's elevated usually more than three times the upper limit or normal. That's consistent with acute pancreatitis. Now for step one and many other um, board type exams, they also want you to know that pancreatitis can also be associated with high levels of amylase. That's another digestive enzyme that's found inside of pancreatic cells. So that's also true, but uh, lipase levels are used much more often clinically because they have better diagnostic accuracy and more specific than amylase level. But for test purposes, you should know both. 
All right, so that's one practical finding related to our topic here. Let's go to question two. So if the pancreatic uh, pancreatitis is very severe, serum calcium levels will be reduced. And that's because if you have severe pancreatitis, that means you're going to have a lot more uh, of fat necrosis, so a lot more free fatty acids being secreted out into the tissue. Therefore, it's going to be a lot more extensive uh, saponification. And so that's going to sap up a lot more of that calcium from the tissues. And eventually, it's going to suck up calcium from the serum. And that's going to then lower the levels of calcium floating around in the serum. And therefore, that means that you're going to have hypocalcemia, meaning low levels of calcium in the blood. And this is, again, um, very clinically applicable because for patients who are being admitted for acute pancreatitis, we actually monitor their calcium levels. And it's been found that if you check their calcium levels after 48 hours, um, it's actually an important parameter in what's called the Ranson, uh, Ranson criteria, which is uh, one of those predictive models for severity and prognosis of pancreatitis. So hypocalcemia generally does not occur in just regular mild pancreatitis. So if it is present in pancreatitis, it suggests there's severe pancreatitis and extensive uh, uh, fat necrosis and saponification. All right, so now let's wrap up with a 60 second summary. So fat necrosis is necrosis of adipocytes. There are two main causes. First one is enzymatic, which is mediated by lipase that's secreted by the pancreas. And this causes peripancreatic fat necrosis. That's a consequence of pancreatitis, which is a liquefactive necrosis itself. The second cause or mechanism is non-enzymatic, and this is uh, mainly due to trauma to adipocytes, and this primarily occurs in the breast. The key features of fat necrosis are that there's release of free fatty acids from adipocytes. This is going to lead to saponification, which is where those free fatty acids are going to bind calcium and form deposits, as shown here. So these are going to have a chalky white area's appearance on gross pathology. All right, that's it, and that's all. If you enjoyed this video, you want to learn more about this topic, uh, check out these related videos that I've linked here. Uh, you can also search our channel, Chalk Talk Med, for other topics to see if they're covered. And finally, if there are other videos that you want to see or you just want to give some feedback, please uh, feel free to drop your thoughts in the comment section. But thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.